Crosses and horsemanship have been part of man's history for centuries. It was not until the Renaissance that the importance of dressage really grew when aristocrats traveled to the great schools of Europe to study the art of horsemanship. The first riding school was set in Naples, Italy in 1532, where horse masters experimented with different methods of training horses. The experience in this riding school was the basis for the earliest form of dressage. Another school was established in Versailles, France during the 16th century. In 1735, the Imperial Spanish Riding School opened in Vienna. This riding academy still cultivates the classical art of riding and gives public performance in its magnificent hall several times a week. For hundreds of years, the knowledge of training for a noble was esoteric and was out of reach for the average citizen. It was not until several decades ago that the knowledge of dressage became available for the white public. The knowledge of dressage was imported to the United States from Europe and very often replaced Western riding. <laughs> Debbie Weber, like many other American horsemen, used to ride Western. It was not until 10 years ago that she sold her quarter horses, abandoned western riding, and became a dressage rider. I used to ride uh, quarter horses, and when I was cantering along, they would jolt me at the, at the canter. It would be one, two, three, and my back would just be really stiff and really sore all the time. And I could never figure out. When I would be walking along the day after the horse show, with a sore back and a sore tailbone, I finally got smart and realized that there had to be another way to ride other than a western saddle, a great big heavy western saddle and a horse that kept cantering downhill. After I realized that there was a better way to ride than cantering downhill all day and having to go to the chiropractor after I rode, I also learned that there was a different kind of horse. No more jolting for me at the canter. Along with learning that there are other kinds of horses and other ways to ride other than western, I also realized that I better get some lessons. I, all this riding by the seat of my pants that I did when I was a kid on wild ponies and wild horses that were, you know, with a heavy western saddle and the horn to hold on to, just wasn't going to cut it. But I wanted to be a more elegant rider. Well, from having ridden western so many years, it took a long time to change my ways of riding. I wanted to curl up and I wanted to just you know, hunch over, and I wanted my horse to just go galloping along on a loose rein, and it didn't work that way. In dressage, you're learning the, the, the finer points. You're learning to ride up and to hold your horse and to appreciate the beauty of the horse, doing the movements, the natural movements that he has in the pasture, except that you're on his back. The Walt Disney film, The Miracle of the White Stallions, made a profound impression on many young Americans who until then knew only the one art of riding, that is Western riding. The film tells about the moving of the white Lipizzanos from the Spanish riding school to a Seventy during World War II. Back in the 70s, I can remember the movie, The Miracle of the White Stallions, the Lipizzaners in Vienna, and I, I wanted to ride like that more than anything. <coughs> Lynn Berg, who has already showed successfully through a force level dressage, recalls. I started out as a western rider only because that was the only style of riding there was where I was when I was a kid. And uh, when I was, I believe, seven years old, I saw a film called The Miracle of the White Stallions. And it had a profound influence on me. I, at that time, I knew that what I wanted to do was dance with horses. I, it was made such a, had such a profound influence on me that I remembered the music from it. And uh, that's, that's how I started in dressage. Nancy Klein is the head instructor and stable manager at the Devonshire Equestrian Center at Bloomington, Indiana. She is a state champion at first, third, fourth, and FEI levels. The FEI, that is the International Equestrian Federation, is the body that controls dressage competitions worldwide. Currently, she shows a horse who was trained to Grand Prix. It takes probably anywhere from, depending on the talent of the horse, 
four to six years to take a horse to the Grand Prix level, and it takes a rider anywhere from 10 to 15 years. Uh, I've currently been at this for 15 years, and my horse uh, is a 14-year-old Westphalian gelding who um, has the mind, which is very important to do this, and the physical ability. How do you get a horse to that point? Um, the horse has to be willing, and from the day you begin working with the horse, you have to make sure that you allow the horse to do his job. You ask him, you try to make it as clear as possible, and then you allow him to do it by being relaxed, by being light, and rewarding the horse through feeling, through the feeling in your body, by being kind and being light very, very difficult for a horse to achieve this level. Um, it's very confusing to communicate a lot of these movements and ideas to the horse, mainly because we can't talk to them. So it's through your body language that you are asking the horse to do what it is you want him to do. Dressage is the French word meaning training. The, the principles of this training include suppling, stretching, and relaxing exercises that meant to make the horse fit in a better athlete. These exercises are based on movement which are natural to the horse and which can often be seen when the horse performs when turned loose in the paddock. The exercises help the horse to move himself with more balance and thus to carry the rider in a better way so that the two of them can better accomplish their goals. In dressage, there are many different levels of riding, starting from the very beginning level, which is walk, trot, and canter, through the Grand Prix level. The highest level of dressage is passage and piaf. It requires a high degree of skills on both the parts of the horse and the rider. An extended trot, that's a difficult movement for a horse to accomplish because it requires a lot of lowering of the hindquarters, rounding of the back, and lifting of the front end of the horse. And this requires um, a great deal of bending on the part of the horse. The shoulder in is considered the most perfect movement for teaching the horse a variety of things. And one of it, the start of engagement of the hindquarters, which is the basis for everything you're going to do with your horse, it starts in the shoulder in. And that means that the horse's inside hind leg has to step a little farther under the center of gravity, and the shoulders will move toward the outside rein and outside leg of the, of the rider and stop there. And this is a very good suppling and bending exercise, as well as the haunches in, which keeps the shoulders in place and moves the haunches toward the center of the ring or toward the rider's inside leg. The massage is a very high, slow, elevated trot with a lot of bend through the hips and hocks and back of the horse where he pushes himself up off the ground in diagonal pairs and it seems to be floating and hovering above the ground. The piaf is a trot in place and done properly, the haunches should visibly lower toward the ground and the hind leg should come closer to the front leg with a distinct rounding of the horse's back and elevation of the horse's front end, and the horse does a diagonal pair trot in place. It's very important, if you are going to get on a horse, that you give him all the musculature advantage that you can. You want him to be a suspension bridge. You want his back to be round because that's what holds you up in the saddle rather than allowing the horse to be hollow, or a hammock, I call it. And a lot of the good Western trainers, and I see, you know, even racetrack people, where they, they work on, there's a ligament that goes all the way through the tail, up across the haunches, across the back, across the neck, and all the way to the pole. And it's called the nuchal ligament. And this forms a structure, or a, 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 a suspension bridge. And and that's what keeps you up in the saddle, doesn't put so much pressure on the legs. So um, I think it's very important that you start with your horses collected. Um, that doesn't mean crammed in with their neck into their shoulder. That means the roundness of the top line. During the lunge work, what I do is I help the horse 
develop these muscles without the hindrance of my weight. I can also see how he's moving. I want to see that the symmetry of the motion of the legs. I want to see that they reach farther forward and laterally. Um, what I work on on the lunge line is to make the horse go forward. I teach the horse to, I allow the horse to teach himself his balance and to discipline himself to keep himself round. The work in hand is I teach that the horse can keep his, his head down and cross his legs. I teach him to be graceful and I, I would best refer to that as collect the work in collection. As a rider, I realize how little physically that I need to do when I can make the horse on the ground do these things without the aids of my weight or my legs. Dominique Barbier is a dressage trainer. Along with the training of his horses in California, he teaches the dressage in many countries in the United States, as well as in Europe and even in North Africa. He distinguishes between competitive dressage and non-competitive dressage. The two, so he argues, are essentially different in both of their training and aspiration. For him, the true aspiration of the rider should be to dance with his horse. As you know, I, I consider dressage like a, a, an art, the art of, of, of riding. And um, sometimes it's very difficult to see uh, some of the competition which has been done right, right now. I think the problem is that they uh, try to um, have different dressage. And I think there's just one dressage. Therefore, I would like the competition to be uh, more classically correct, if I can say that. Uh, well, I think that uh, uh, the, the competition uh, uh, could be done in a very constructive way as long as um, you know, the, the horses are part of it and the horses and the rider un, enjoy it. Classically speaking, I think that it's, uh, uh, it should be just one riding, one dressage and not a special dressage for competition. I don't uh, want to have a difference between the art of riding and competition. And that's what is happening. do help a lot of people training their horses the, the proper way and then you know in competition then they do whatever they, they wish to do. But it's very important for me that uh, the, uh, the, the horse is classically trained and basically enjoy what he's doing. And uh, you know I, I, I generally say in competition you can have 60% of the points if you force the horse doing something but the last 40% is very difficult obtained from the horse because that's the, uh, the percentage that the horse give to you and uh, as far as I'm concerned I enjoy the last 40 percent, the first 60 percent I'm really interested in too. Uh, the last 40 uh, percent when the horse is giving you the movement, that's what I'm... Mr. Barbier attempts to base the method of his dressage on the principles of oriental thinking which he identifies with Zen philosophy. The key for reaching good results in dressage is grounded in visualizing the horse performing perfect movements, centered riding, and lightening. What I really teach is the mental communication between the horse and the rider, and trying to have a uh, as deep communication as possible. Um, I use a lot of visualization, in other words, having a clear picture of what you want in your in your head, and I think when the, the horse, after lunging and working hand, um, is willing to dance with you and he knows how to read the picture, the visualization you had in your head, then we have to pretty close, uh, as perfect relationship as we can. Uh, if the horse is relaxed, the rider is, is relaxed and willing to communicate and visualize, I think we have a pretty good uh, uh, beginning of a relationship, if I can say that. Clear, having a clear picture in your head of what you want and um, it's just like a movie, if I can say that. It's just like a tape that you play and you see yourself and your horse uh, in the position that, that you want and in the movement that you want. And it's like having, a, 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 it's better than a movie. It's, it's the way you want to feel, the way you want your horse to feel, the way you want both of you to feel to, together. And that visualization in, um, in, in, in a question term is that the, your knowledge is a clearer and clearer visualization. In, in other words, it's more and more simple and clearer. And it's constant. Uh, constant by that I mean you can't have a picture and then a blank, a picture and then a blank. You need to have picture, 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 picture.
picture? Well, the visualization, you get those pictures from the fact that uh, you look at horses a lot, uh, you launch them, and you work them in hand. And all those occasions to look at your horse performing walk, trot, and canter, then then you you uh, you have a clearer and clearer picture of what you want. And of course, the the higher movement is the same. You need to look at them and see uh, how the horses are uh, performing classically, and uh, and you get your picture better and better every time. Mr. Barbier argues, as one may often hear that from many others, that people ride the way they are mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. This explains why horses perform differently for different riders. Well, people sometimes have a tendency to think that dressage is very difficult, and it's not very difficult. Uh, if you have the correct attitude, and if you feel that, that you're centered, and your horse is centered with you, and, and you're communicating, then it's a very happy picture, and it's not difficult. It's, it's actually to realize what you have to do is to try to be as consistent in your thinking as possible and um, not very different from from life I think that the people have a tendency to separate horses from life now this is very much the, the, the same if you um, the more you give to your horse the, the more the horse is going to give you back and the lighter you are the, the, the lighter the horse is and I think that um, the less you do uh, physically, the more the horse is going to perform for you and people are going to be happy to perform for you. For you. Therefore, it's a, it's a philosophy that, that means that the less you do, the more the, the horse is going to do for you. And uh, every time you repeat an exercise, the second time you do less than the first time. And if you do that, you refine your communication and you refine the, the work with your horses to, to, to a point that's very, very enjoyable and very, very uh, mental. <laughs> The problem with dressage is there are basically two schools, and one is the school of competition, which is the sport of dressage. I think in a way it's a good thing to go test, to see how well you do, see how well your training goes, but not as a focus of your training. I am more interested in the art of dressage, which is about the relationship of the animal and the beauty of the movement. And what that requires is that um, I don't ask for something of my horse that I don't think he can give me. The movements of dressage are to develop the horse's gates. And, and they're exercises. They're like Tai Chi. They teach the horse to move his body more fluidly and more efficiently. Um, so I look at the horse and or f what I feel under me and I it's like I prescribe a certain set of exercises it, it loses its spontaneity and and performance if it's if at this letter you do this at this letter you do that um, I, art is a dynamic process being that I had um, my training in performing arts I, I, I see that it's it's not something you can who can play the highest note, who can play the fastest, it, but it's about the expression of yourself and the expression of the horse and, and in, in beauty. Riding is to allow the horse's personality to come through his performance. I think by trying to dominate the animal, just like if you try to dominate people, it's going to squelch their personality. And what I'd like to do is channel their passion into something else. Um, there's a young, young Andalusian that I ride, and uh, the progression of training, he should not be doing Piaf and Passage, but that's what he wants to do, and that's the way he expresses himself. So I allow him to do it. I spend most of the time working on other things, while in the back of his mind is, when do we get to do this really fun, fun thing? He, he gets so dramatic about things. So what I try to do is, rather than have him be dramatic and upset, I let him put that emotion into his performance. And, and that's what I like. I like that spirit of riding, of it not being a dominating thing, that it be that both of us can express ourselves. Although dressage can be done by everyone, doing it correctly in its highest movements is considered difficult. 
not just everyone can reach a deep understanding of the communication between himself as a rider and the horse. Of course, once the horse gets the idea, it's not that difficult. But the rider has to learn to be communicative and very, very relaxed on the horse. The horse cannot perform these upper level movements, the piaf and the passage, and the degree of collection that you're asking for if the horse has been pulled in, has been ridden with the reins to try to bring the horse into collection, has not been allowed the freedom of movement. There's very, very many other technical things that we can get into uh, about how to train the horse to this level. But basically, you have to remember, number one, you have to have a very good trainer. Number two, you have to have um, a very good instructor. If that happens to be the same person, that's great, because you always need someone on the ground, and you always need to look for the answers to what is going wrong in yourself. This is a sport of practical application. You have to more so, I think, than any other sport, because you are dealing with a living, thinking, feeling being and not a tennis racket or a baseball bat, you can understand the theory very much. I, I did, I've understood theory for very many years, but was not able to apply it, was not able to put it into application for very many years. And, and, and this, I feel, is due to the nature of the horse. It's because you have, to, you have to know it and be able to feel it right away. You can't know it and ride the horse and after your ride say, well, did I feel it or didn't I feel it? It has to happen almost immediately. And this takes very many hours in the saddle of riding and listening to your horse to be able to say, did I feel what I know? Did I, do I understand what I learned in the book? Is this it or is this not it? And this is also where it is very important to have a very good instructor who does not only shout orders at you and say, circle here, turn left there, go across the diagonal there, but also says, your horse did this. Did you feel that? Because it's very, very important in riding to be able to feel and to understand the theory that you, you think you have up here. The powerful image of horses have been always played a significant role in art as well as in human psychology. The relationship with horses often replaces different emotional needs. This explains then why some of the rider's personality is often easily uh, being reflected in riding. Many of the old European cultures, the royalty, all studied dressage because it's such a discipline. You find out a lot about your character through the study of dressage or riding with horses. Uh, for instance, you come up against all the time what you can't do, what you're afraid of, what you physically can't do, what you're mentally unwilling to do. and. You have, the horse seems to be this very non-judgmental, uh, I want to say, person that helps you find who you are, helps you develop your character and your personality. Um, you can't lose your temper. You have to be very patient, and you have to cooperate with the animal. You have to have a, a understanding of how that other being works, how that other being thinks. I tend to prefer riding thoroughbreds, they're real sensitive horses but real honest and they're kind of a challenge also because you need to ride yourself because it's so hard to do. Physically and mentally it takes a lot out of you and I find that very hard to do both of them, especially with like a living creature such as a horse. It's hard mentally and physically because physically each person is different as far as their build, their size, their flexibility. And me as a personal person, have, I'm not very flexible or coordinated, I feel. Um, so I feel like it's a real challenge for me to get my body to do the things that is needed to be done. And mentally, I just uh, there's a lot to learn and a lot to remember and there's a lot of feeling in the mental. You have to react with feel. 
the same as the way of dressage riding might reveal one's own strengths and weaknesses, it can help in reshaping one's own self-image. I wanted to be a more elegant rider. I never felt like I had a good body image. You know, I was very self-conscious and I felt like that I was a klutz. I couldn't do anything right. I couldn't climb the rope in gym. I couldn't run to realize I wasn't a sports person. But when I got on a horse, all that changed. People ride for so many different reasons. I think the beauty of horses probably is the most attractive thing about riding. But there's a feeling that you have when you're on a horse's back that is like nothing else in the world. It's, it's, um, it's that power, the power that everyone wants and so seldom gets. It's, it's the feel of the muscles of the horse and the, and the energy and, and the containment of the energy and the, and the controlled, uh, the controlled cadence of the gates. That, uh, that there's something about it that's mystical. It's rhythmic and yet it, it's unpredictable. And it's it's violent and yet it's soft. Um, I can't even put it into words, but but knowing that a horse can give me that um, has been something that that's made us, I think, just never give up and, and to try to be a better rider. I think we all want to be a part of our horse.